on Purple Daily, uh, our friend Sage Rosenfels. What is going on, Sage? Well, everybody does know how important gas is to you and that you should try to keep as much gas uh, to yourself as possible. So we, we understand that you're paying <laughs> on this uh, on this Monday afternoon. Uh, OK, uh, let's quickly get into football. Um, uh, now, first of all, I do get paid for mileage, so uh, I'm, I, I'm doing OK there because my Honda Civic, it's great mileage. So I'm not suffering. It was really the time that it took to dro- drive down there and watch a quarterback put together one of the saddest performances that I can remember by someone who's considered a franchise quarterback. This would normally be reserved for like Ryan Fitzpatrick to have a complete meltdown day where it's a no show and he gives your team no chance whatsoever to win. ESPN has adjusted the QBR yesterday after the game, it posted a four and uh, they've bumped it up to an eight out of a hundred. So, uh, and the thing you talked about with, uh, you know, Ryan Fitzmagic, as I like to say, to call him, is when he does have those bad games where he throws three interceptions and fumbles twice or whatever, they lose by like 30 points. But what, what you love about the guy is that he just continues to go out there and just keep slinging it with no, you know, sort of no conscience. Like, well, if you throw another one, it doesn't really matter. He doesn't play it close to best, even if the game uh, is out of hand. He just keeps going out there and keeps fighting. And you sort of respect him for that. You know, this is a different situation. This was two interceptions, two fumbles, one fumble loss in a very, very close ball game. Yeah, no, and it was one of those where immediately you think, oh, this is going to go badly from the very beginning, but then the door is cracked open, and there have been too many times, Sage, over the last year and two games that we have seen from Kirk Cousins where there has been opportunities to win that, that, that just weren't taken. And you could go back through the schedule last year, week 17, they have a chance to get into the playoffs. It's a no show. They score 10 points. You go to Seattle, they hold Seattle to what? I mean, I think it was somewhere in the range of six points in the first three quarters and the Vikings can't win that game. They hold down. Even new England was not shredding them and they lose that game 24 to 10. Last year, the game in Chicago, where for the first half, the defense plays really well against Mitch Trubisky and that Bears offense. They lose. They have an opportunity to beat New Orleans. They lose. Even the Los Angeles Rams, when the defense didn't play well, they had the ball at the end of the game down by seven points and they lose. And I guess my question to you, Sage, now that everyone has gotten out their rage and anger toward Kirk Cousins for this game yesterday is what what now? Right. I mean, what, what, like, how are we supposed to look at this and find any sort of silver lining or any sort of belief? Because the, the, my, my feeling from reading Twitter and reading what fans are saying is that they have sort of come to this place of, you know what, this is going to be how it goes. Almost every time this quarterback is in a big game and goes up against a team with a good defense. And what are we supposed to do about that? If you're Vikings fans, like, well, what else are you supposed to say other than just I guess we wait till 2022. I mean, I guess, Sage, I just don't know what to tell people after that one. Like, this is what he has done for his entire career against good teams in big situations. This is the Kirk Cousins that this team signed to $84 million contract. And it's a, it's a very tough situation right now because if this season continues as it is right now, the Vikings will be 8-8 eight and eight at the end of the season. They won't make the playoffs. And they've got a $28 million guaranteed uh, salary cap hit for next year for Cousins if they choose to try to get rid of him or something. So it's a very, very tough situation uh, this year. It's a tough situation going forward. And the only thing that you can hope is that Kirk does play better. And, you know, we talk a lot about stats on this show. Uh, I think it's NFL media. And this The game of football in general, uh, way more statistics driven than I think, I guess baseball is too, but, you know, more than like basketball. But You know, the stats that matter to me are what I would call like clutch stats. And Kirk generally fails in a lot of those. You know, clutch is third down. Clutch Mm -hmm. is red zone. Clutch is end of half, end of game. And yesterday, uh, he sort of failed on a lot of those. I mean, he he played some third downs and did some good things. But uh, in particular, obviously, you know, when you open up the whole segment uh, with the play-by-play of that interception, you know, first and goal at the seven yard line. You shouldn't you, you shouldn't hear the phrase "Hell Mary" by <laughs> right. the announcer, right? right? It yeah. shouldn't be. He's throwing what fourth down. Sure, you're throwing up. You give a guy a chance because we all know in a Hell Mary, it's you know sometimes the offense catches him, sometimes the defense catches him, and sometimes the ball hits the ground. That should not be the case on first and goal from a seven for a freshman college quarterback 
much less a you know eight or nine year uh, veteran. So obviously that was the play of the football game that really cost the Vikings. Uh, there were a lot of other good and bad plays within that game. I just went back and watched it this morning. If you want to start looking like silver linings, I'll, I will say this. 95% of that game and 95% of the players, I thought the Vikings played really well. Uh, the, obviously, the opening drive of defense, you know, it, it was way too easy by the Packers. They went boom, boom, boom. It was like four or five plays. They scored a touchdown exactly the way Matt LaFleur drew it up and you know, probably better than what Matt LaFleur drew it up. It was you know, right off the bat. So obviously, that's not good. But that's the first quarter. That's the first five minutes of the first quarter. You can come back from that. And you can even come back from 21 to nothing, uh, slowly but surely. And the rest of that game, I mean, the Packers are scoreless the entire second half. That's a huge positive. Uh, but when it came down to it on those clutch, clutch plays, uh, Kirk and, and I would say mostly Kirk would, did not come through. The defense played really, really well. I, I, there's guys that are showing up. Harrison Smith is all over the place. Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, the defense is playing extremely well. Obviously, the running game, that is a monster positive for this football team. Uh, and so if you want to look at Silver Lions, th th this team runs the football extremely well. They're second in the league right now in rushing. Dalvin Cook, if he stays healthy, uh, he, you know, he might rush for uh, 1,700, 1,800 yards. I mean, he is perfect for this offense. The O-line does a pretty good job of, of blocking those guys up front in the running game. But Dalvin can take anything to the house. He also is really good. You know, he's sticking his head down and, and, and driving through for three or four yards and just those ugly black and blue, you know, type plays. But, you know, there's issues in pass protection. There's issues at the quarterback position. Uh, but you got to be happy with the way the team is running the football and the way the play, team is playing good defense. And they're playing very good defense. And guys are showing up that don't play a ton of defense. You know, Jerron Curse made a lot of plays yesterday. You know, he's a guy that probably wouldn't be playing if the Vikings were – you know, uh, fully healthy at the DB position, but he made some good plays yesterday. And there were a lot of other guys who played extremely well. I thought Kendricks played, uh, you know, well in that ball game. Obviously, Daniil Hunter, uh, again, terrorizing Aaron Rodgers. And so there's a lot of good, positive things that pull out of that football game. Uh, but it was at the key moments, at the clutch moments in the game, uh, in particular, the quarterback just did not come through. I mean, that's what makes it so bad, Sage, is the fact that when you go through even last year, how many times did they play mostly good games top to bottom, and yet you saw them come up short? I mean, there, there's quite a few examples of that. And yesterday was another one of those good performances by the defense. No, it was not the 2000 Baltimore Ravens. And it always frustrates me to get tweets. Well, they gave up 21 points. Look, 21 points is not a lot in the no, NFL and one today. One of them, I believe, was a was a fumble in, in short field. territory, right? Yep. So, yep. you know, you, and again, you turn the ball over, and you know, the quarterback had three turnovers. You know, at the end of the day, the Packers had 335 yards of offense. They they were a little leaky, you know, on, on the run defense. You know, and then I, I, this is, and we were talking about this, you know, sort of coming into the season with Green Bay, Aaron Rodgers. You sort of saw him. You see him under center more. I feel like in years past, you see that, you know, that, that running game, Aaron Jones does a really good job running the football. He plows ahead for four fives and sixes a lot. And you'd say run behind his pads. And then they do a lot more play action than they did in years past. And so, you know, Aaron's numbers are down a little bit, but they're, you know, the pretty dang efficient on offense. They did, did they did not turn the ball over and, uh, and they made enough plays to win. The Vikings had 421 yards of offense, seven yards per play for the Packers, 4.9. 198 yards rushing, 198 yards rushing, 7.3 yards per rush. It's hard to lose when you run that it's well. It's hard to lose, but it's easy to lose when you have four turnovers, and it's easy to lose when you have eight penalties for 100 yards. And when you have a quarterback that just pulls a complete no-show, and that's my question for you, Sage, is what exactly happened there? I mean, it, like, how does this happen to Kirk Cousins? And maybe you don't have an explanation because if, I if we did, then we would solve it pretty easily. But when you look at the, the games, and maybe this is just what average players in sports do, like basketball players, if you're an average three-point shooter, you don't make one out of every three, right? You make three in a row, and then you miss three in a row. And maybe that's just what happens to him. For someone who is so talented as he is and so accurate. And I watch him in training camp and you watch him when he has games where he's on and he'll just make throw after throw after throw on the money. And it wasn't just this terrible decision. That was an interception Sage. It was overthrowing Kyle Rudolph, which is almost impossible to do. The guy is an NBA power forward and you overthrow him. He missed a couple of guys with just high 
basic throws that should have been there. So there, there, there are a couple of throws. Let's, let's just go back. There was a, I think it was about a third and seven. And in the NFL and in college football too, they have, we, when you see a lot of cover two coverage, that, that means that the two safeties are deep and both of the corner players are, they sort of hover around between five, seven, eight yards. Uh, if they don't have any threat to the flat, they will what they call sink back, sink back to 15 even you know to 18 yards unless there's some sort of uh yeah, I said there's a there's a somebody run a flat route or a wide route by a running back and then they'll come up and because they're responsible for the flat area there was a throw yesterday where adam thielen uh ran what they call a you know, call it a circus route but really it's a corner route from the outside you stem inside you get up to about 15 yards and you take it to about 20 23 yards at the sideline that throw Versus cover two, if, if the corner does not sink back, which he didn't, he came up on the flat route, that throw is what you call pitch and catch. That should be easy for an NFL quarterback that's not getting pressure. The Thielen had tons of space around him. There was no pressure on the quarterback. The corner didn't even really make it hard. He really came up way too hard. He's getting coached. That cornerback is getting coached to, hey, you got to sink back further, force him to throw the flat, then come up and make the tackle. But everything was there for the Vikings except for the throw, and it wasn't even close. It was a good two yards from Thielen. He didn't even couldn't even dive at it. It yep. was so far out. Um, another throw that was a huge miss. Again, it was another third and seven, perfectly drawn up by Kevin Stefanski. It was sort of a deep out route with a high corner behind it. Uh, and that was Stefan Diggs. Uh, you know, again, it's a tougher throw, but you got to hit him. You got to give your guy a chance, and you can't overthrow him in that situation. He overthrows Diggs by. Uh, by a half yard, uh, you know, incomplete pass. Those are clutch plays in the football game that aren't just incompletions. Those are, you know, almost turnovers in a sense uh, because now you have to punt. So he had a couple of those in the football game, much much less obviously the interception at the seven. The other interception, I thought he had Rudolph open as his first read. He came backside early uh, and, and the, actually the, the, the far safety broke up that play and it was tipped and caused an interception. And then the fumble, that he got back and then the fumble right after that. I mean, if you fumble, you better hang on to the football after that and be you know, extra ball security. Mm -hmm. And he fumbles again. So, you know, it's got to be very, very frustrating in that offensive room today, uh, whether it's the staff room as the coaches or as the players, because so many guys you know, played extremely well, but not everybody did. Uh, I, Xavier Rhodes, I don't think played good football in that, in that game. Uh, there's a lot of things from a coverage perspective and it wasn't, you know, him, getting beat man to man it was you know playing uh, a certain coverage and then you know not be not uh, playing his responsibility and a simple flat route from the one yard line turns into a 15 yard gain that was on Xavier Rhodes uh, there was three or four plays that, that Xavier the first play of the game he should have sunk back further and taken away that deep crossing route to to Devontae Adams that there's a couple plays in the game where he didn't play well and run support as well uh, he, didn't, he didn't play great football uh, Rudy's got to be a better job, do a better job blocking, uh, in particular in the run game. He has to be a little bit more physical in, in the blocking scheme. So not everybody played great, uh, but the, the, this team played good enough. They played good enough. The coaches coached good enough to win this football game on the road against their rival, uh, but their quarterback obviously did not. So let's talk about why that might be, because I need some sort of theory. And I know maybe you don't have an answer, but could it be anxiousness could it be nervousness could it be that he is a tightly wound person and he feels the moment more than other people could it be that he desperately wanted himself to be the reason they won i got that theory from a few people if we rec recklessly speculate on why this happens to kirk cousins so often um i i would like to because it's it's really fascinating to me sage i think he's an incredibly talented quarterback and when this team went back and they watched all of his throws and all of his plays, they probably saw a lot of the throws like he made to Stefan Diggs. A lot of the throws in 2017, he made one in Seattle to Josh Doxson. That was just an incredible play. Last year, he had a few throws, uh, especially against Los Angeles, that were just remarkable. There was one against Green Bay that he fits into a tiny window to Adam Thielen that is one of the throws of the year. When I watch NFL Network, it's on one of their promos all offseason. It was such a good throw. And yet here we are oftentimes talking about a big moment, a big game where he can't get it done. And this almost feels like cliche, but you go back to uh, he had a chance in 2016 to beat the New York Giants and get into the playoffs. And the Giants, I think, weren't even really that good that year. 
and he throws two interceptions. He falls apart. He has a QBR of 18 in that game after having a very, very good season in 2016 to miss the playoffs. Does the same thing last year in 2017. I mean, is this something that there is any code that can crack it? I mean, I think if you're a Vikings fan, this has to drive you absolutely up the wall and it probably does in the building too to look at somebody who so consistently lets his team down when he's needed the most i just cannot imagine the frustration if you are delvin cook and, and you didn't get the ball in that play or if you're stefan diggs and he overthrew you when you were wide open running for it would have been a touchdown if he hits him i mean this just happens so often to him i don't know what the answer is well, and like, you know, what is clutch and how, what is the mindset, you know, the sports psychology mindset of how do you uh, allow somebody to, you know, sort of let their mind go and just let their natural abilities take over? Because when he is on, he's extremely impressive. But when he's off, uh, he doesn't he looks like a, a, a bad backup in some ways. And obviously, he's not a very good athlete. I mean, let's just let's just get that out of the way when he runs the bootleg stuff he regularly gets run down by the defensive ends. And he has to throw the ball away. We saw twice yesterday, Aaron Rodgers, who's an extremely good athlete, I think an underrated athlete, basically the same play by the defensive end, but athletic enough to get around the outside, flip his hips and make great throws. And one to the end, to end the game, to basically turn into a, a two minute mm -hmm. offense yep, or yep. a four minute offense and punt and, and, uh, you know, put the Vikings at their own uh, 10 yard line or whatever with five seconds left. So, uh, He's not a very good athlete. He has to be accurate uh, and he has to make good decisions. And, you know, when the draft stuff comes around next spring, I'll get phone calls from all over the country and I'll break down these, some of these quarterbacks. And what I go off of is decision making and accuracy, decision making and accuracy. And it's the consistent decision making and accuracy. Uh, and, you know, accuracy is one of those times, one of those things that you ha that is sort of over time, over the course of a game. And, you know, whether you throw for 70 percent or 60 percent or whatever, you know, are you accurate on the throws that are there? You know, are, are that that are the guys are open, that the, the timing is good in the pocket. You have protection. Are you accurate in thro those throws and are you making good decisions? And and yesterday he didn't make you know great decisions and he wasn't accurate on some I said fairly easy throws. And and uh, so, yeah, it's again, I, I, I don't we don't, I can't. I can't sit here and go into the psychology of what's going on in Kirk Cousins' head. I can't. It's like, it's, that's just, that's impossible. Uh, he's going to have to figure that out. The team's going to have to figure that out. Uh, or, or else we'll get this, this sort of same old performance up and down throughout the year. And there'll be some big yards and big games. But the question is, how many wins will the stats add up to? Uh, and if you go off of his history, his stats have always added up to somewhere between nine and seven wins. And that's not good enough with this football team, which, again, this team played very good yesterday. And I think not great, but this team played very good yesterday. Definitely good enough to win.